consider it a great honor and a great privilege to welcome our serving overseer. So CGCC Diaspora Families Fellowship, please join me in welcoming our father and our pastor, Pastor Tunde Bakari. <clears throat> welcome you, sir. Thank you so very much. Uh, praise God from whom all blessings flow. Good day to you all, wherever you may be on the planet. And welcome to the second quarterly seminar of the CGCC Diaspora Family Fellowship in 2022, the acceptable year of the Lord. My wife and I are very glad to be with you again and to share with you a timely word that we believe will keep you on the cutting edge of what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to the churches in this hour. Before we go any further, kindly permit me to place on the register a deep gratitude and that of my wife and family and profound appreciation. For those of you who invested tremendous time in prayers and those who like Dr. and Mrs. Samuel, Fadi, who are physically present both in Lagos and during the declaration ceremony on the night of May 2022 in Abuja. May the good Lord remember your prayers and sacrifice and give us an idea of our dreams in my and your lifetime in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. And the people said, Amen. Happy birthday, Brother Deola, on a fall called the Kurudu Man, now operating from Atlanta. And same to Sister Stella, the co-celebrant. As your days, so shall be your strength in the mighty name of Jesus. Thanks so much for such a time of wholesome worship. God bless you richly. As you might be aware, Mrs. B and I have taken some time off from our active schedule in Nigeria. And I've been in the UK since last week, Thursday, to rest and to reflect for some time before returning to Nigeria next week. So if you find my voice <clears throat> a little bit, uh, not as strong as it used to be, I've been sleeping and sleeping and sleeping and praying to God to please deliver me from excess sleep. <laughs> I'm sure I'll catch on as we pro proceed. Thank God that in the midst of our vacation, we can deploy technology to minister virtually to the body of Christ globally almost every other day since we got here, including today's meeting. To God alone be all the glory and praise. Uh, that shows you that vacation, as far as we are concerned, is still working because we have entered into God's rest. I've not seen or experienced a joyful and peaceful moment like I've experienced in the past few days after all the hectic time in Abuja. Please, I want to implore you to pay attention as I share some truths with you tonight or today, depending on where you are, truths that you must keep in your fingertips for every kingdom assignment you may have now or in the near future. And please permit me also to carefully separate the issues of the CGCC Diaspora Family Fellowship from the PTB4 Nigeria issues. It is commonly said among Yoruba people in Nigeria that Oku da Pomoya which simply means you cannot join a funeral service with a wedding ceremony. This is why funeral services in Nigeria are carried out on Fridays and wedding ceremonies on Saturdays especially in the Orthodox churches in our client. We will therefore separate fellowship issues from political issues so that we can focus on each in its allotted time. I hope that's all right by you. I'm very sure that we'll have a robust virtual meeting on Saturday, the 16th of July, 2022, dedicated to the PTB for Nigeria issues by the grace of God. And on that day, I will give you an up-to-date account on Project 16. Suffice it to say today, to those who are actively involved in both, 
that Project 16 is alive and well, and he who calls us is faithful, he is the one who also will do it. Wait for the 16th of July as I unveil what is going to happen next about Project 16. I do not know how we came by 16 July, but that's the handiwork of Brother Gobo. I gave him two days and he chose August 16 because he wants to hear everything about Project 16. We trust God for that day and I trust that we'll meet in peace in Jesus' name. For the sake of those joining us for the first time today, let me start with a summary of our first quarterly seminar on Saturday, April 30th, 2022. The subject of our contemplation that day was, do not allow your past to keep you from stepping into your future. Do not allow your past to keep you from stepping into your future. I remember sharing with you that if God were to wait until those of us who are being used by him, if he were to wait until we are perfect to use us, no one would ever be used by God. So I encourage those who have ever struggled with a feeling of inadequacy or not being good enough to be used by God, not to think that they are alone. I remember saying then that in reality, God has only called one perfect person, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ, the sinless Son of God, who became sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Apart from Christ and Christ alone, everyone else God has ever called to do something for him, including you and I, including all general superintendents and general overseers, including bishops and pope and the prelate, as a very fallible and flawed individual. Please have it at the back of your mind that God knows our exact condition when he calls us, and he starts with us right where we are. Therefore, it's only the mercy and grace of God that have caused many who did not seem to be great candidates for spiritual leadership to undergo amazing transformations. Many of us, including me, learned on the job. And so don't, don't write yourself off. If God calls you, just respond. It will supply everything you need for the journey and strength for the race. First Corinthians chapter 1, 26 30 to 31 was one of the scriptures relied upon while teaching during the last quarter. 1 Corinthians 1, 26 to 31, he reads, and I quote, For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not that those who are called are not wise, but many of them are not wise. Not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty and best things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen and the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are. Why? That no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him, you and me, you and I, of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that as it is written, he will glories, let him glory in the Lord. That will be a short summary for our teaching last quarter. Before we progress today, let's pray again. Father God, in the name of Jesus, thank you for the prayers offered already by your son and your servant. Dr. Samuel, Father, we thank you for all the comments, opening, and gracious words spoken. Lord, I pray right now that we receive the same grace to minister and to receive what has been ministered. Thank you for inspiration. Thank you for illumination. Thank you for revelation. And after today's meeting, none of us will be the same again. Receive all the glory and all the praise for answers coming from your presence. In Jesus' mighty name, and the people said, Amen. Amen. Today's message is a follow-up on the last one. 
And it is titled, for want of better words, God does not use an untested vessel. Are you fit for the master's use? A statement followed by a question, a long title, because I'm looking for how best to capture everything that has been uh, put in my spirit for you today. The title goes thus, God does not use an untested vessel. Are you fit for the master's use? If you are impatient, you quickly conclude that this title contradicts what was taught before. No, I'm trying to say no matter what situation you find yourself when you are called, there's still training ahead of you, training waiting for you so that God will ensure that he has equipped you, he has tested you before he would deploy you. And then now, having spent quality time on the training, having been born again for many of many years, some of you, are you fit now for the master's use? From the Old and New Testament, we shall read eight verses of Isaiah 28, 9 to 16. Isaiah 28, 9 to 16. And then we quickly go into the New Testament. I will read another eight verses of 1 Peter 2, 1 to 8. Please don't start adding 8 plus 8 to make 16. That's not the intention. Because those of you who are consumed by Project 16, everything you see is 16. And it's God knows I have no such intention when this was being put together. I just need eight as a start, <laughs> eight verses of Isaiah and eight verses of Peter, first Peter. The first one in the Old Testament, the second one in the New Testament. And from within the New Testament, I'll pick another eight verses to illustrate the Now Testament. The Now Testament. There's the Old Testament based on the blood of bulls and goats uh, that pacified God but did not satisfy him. And then eight verses from the New Testament that is based on the blood of Jesus Christ said, this is the New Testament in my blood that without bulls and goats anymore because God is now fully satisfied. There's nothing more to add to the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. And from that, we'll proceed to another eight verses within or located within New Testament that illustrate that you are now and I are the now Testament that the world will have to read even if they don't have the Bible. Are you fit for the master's use? Let's begin from Isaiah 28 from verse 9 to 16. He reads, and I quote, whom will he teach knowledge? And whom will he make to understand the message? Those just weaned from milk, those just drawn from the breast. A precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. For with stammering lips and another tongue, he will speak to these people to whom he said, this is the rest with which you may cause the weary to rest. And this is refreshing, yet they will not hear. But the word of the Lord was to them, precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little, that they might go and fall backward and be broken and snared and caught. Therefore, hear the word of the Lord, you scum for men who rule these people who are in Jerusalem. Because you have said, we have made a covenant with death <laughs> and with Sheol, we are in agreement. When the overflowing scourge passes through, it will not come to us, for we have made lies our refuge and on the falsehood we have hidden ourselves. Verse Number 16, therefore thus says the Lord God, behold, I lay in Zion a stone for a foundation, 
a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation, whoever believes will not act hastily. The King James Version says, whoever believes will not make haste. We not act hastily. A thorough understanding of the passage just read shows that God is not ready to use those who are immature, babies who are just feeding on milk. By the time we get into the New Testament, you will see that those who are on the milk, are still on milk, have certain standards. And if those who are among us who are who call ourselves mature and not careful, we may not even pass the test of feeding on the milk of God's word. But here is showing us that God is not ready to deploy the immature because you are going to be confronting scornful men who are arrogant, who are proud, who have made covenant with hell and with death, and who have put their trust in a refuge of lives. So in order for God to raise you, to become a mighty vessel in his hand, he must take you through the pattern established in verse 16. Behold, I lay in Zion a stone for a foundation, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation, he who believes shall not make haste. Let me point out before we go further that in the training that we receive, you cannot jump classes. You hardly will find lifts in the kingdom of God or what you call escalator in other nations. It is the steps of a righteous man that are, that are ordered by the Lord. You just don't jump on a lift and pin you on the upper floor. No. Precept was the upper precept. Precept must be, up. these are not just repetitive words to fill the Bible. Precept must be upon precept. Precept must be upon precept. Line must be upon line. Line must be upon line. A little here, a little there. With stammering leaves, it begins to teach us until you become extremely fluent and we can defend the gospel. And no matter who asks us the question concerning this hope, we'll have answers for them. Some of them we will look at today as we progress. But please bear, have at the back of your mind that God says, I'm laying a stone in Zion for a foundation. God's plan is for that stone to become a sure foundation. But the same stone must go through testings and trials. He must be one, a tried stone. God does not deploy an untested vessel, a tried stone. The same stone will become a precious cornerstone. After that, it becomes a sure foundation. A stone, one. A tried stone, two. A precious cornerstone, three. A sure foundation, four. He who believes in all my case. When God says we are his workmanship, is going beyond just the carcass of a furniture. He had assembled the wood, he had walked on the wood, he had covered the wood, and in the tabernacle time, it places us as a display for the world to see. Have that at the back of your mind as we go into 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 1 to 8. And therein again, we are going to have what those who feed on milk, the standard of those who feed on milk before you even go to those who can chew the meat of the word of God. First Peter chapter number two, I begin to read from verse one and we'll read eight verses again. This is for babes in the Lord, therefore laying aside all malice for you to be a thorough breed, even feeding on milk. These are things you must get rid of from your life. Therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking, as new babes desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. 
there is no growth, or at best there will be a stunted growth if you're born again, spirit filled in the choir, in the pulpit, in the pew, you are preaching like a house on fire, but you harbor malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all manner of evil speaking, you do not even qualify to be newborn babes yet, to begin to take milk. As newborn babes, desire the pure milk of the world that you may grow thereby. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious, coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. That was what uh, Dr. Jonathan David said to me yesterday as we were talking uh, a little bit about, about what happened in Nigeria. And he said, the moment I heard your voice and the moment things are going on, what the Holy Spirit said to me is, you have become uh, a stone that the builders have rejected, but you are surely going to become the chief cornerstone. I laughed. I said, my brother, uh, my friend, I'm dead, past, uh, partner in destiny. I know that without a shadow of doubt. And that's why my faith in God is rock solid. Nothing shakes me and nothing moves me at all. It's the finest moment of my life for standing there to raise the banner of God's kingdom. And we close that. Coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious, you also, you also, just like what we read in Isaiah, as living stones are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, it's also contained in the scripture. That's the one we read in Isaiah. Behold, I lay in Zion, a chief cornerstone. Can you see it? All the trying, all the, <laughs> the pressure that the stone was subjected to is no longer reflecting here because it has been tried, it has been tested, it has passed the test. Here it is now. Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. The reason for all the tests and trials and all the vicissitudes of life that you face and all the challenges you face is to prepare you in such a way that you have a solid rock faith in God, regardless of circumstances and situation. No matter who says what, we end up winning. Head when win, tail they lose. Anytime, anywhere, in any given circumstance or situation. Verses seven and eight. Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious. But to those who are disobedient, the stone with the builders rejected has become the chief on a stone, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble, being disobedient to the word to which they also were appointed. As I studied the text of scripture just read, I came to the conclusion that we will remain a terror to those who do not understand who we are, where we are coming from, will be misunderstood, will be called names. You just have to stand there strong and know who you are. Let me go back to Isaiah 28, chapter 9 again, and see what the conclusion is. It says in verse number 17, it said, I will make justice the measuring line, Righteousness, the plummet. The hair will sweep away the refuge of lies. The waters will overflow the hiding place. Your covenant with death will be annulled. Your agreement with show will not stand. When the overflowing scourge passes through, then you'll be trampled down by it. As often as it goes out, it will take you. For morning by morning, it will pass over. And by day and by night, it will be a terror just, just to understand the report. Many people are still wondering, what is Pastor Bakari doing? He did not go to see any delegate. 
He did not go to see any governor. He did not give any money to anybody. How did he want to win? You just be patient until I narrate what I call the Now Testament to you today, and you see what God is doing, what is at work, and what's about to happen. Let your mind be stable on God, focus on him, and let his peace guard your heart and mind until you receive the promise, the fulfillment of the promise which he has made. It is my considered opinion that what's about to happen will remain a terror to those, even those who understand the report, talk less of a people who are nothing but mockers and who scorn the word of God. Let me also say further that the type of people that this kind of report would be a terror to uh, the present generation whose disposition is towards quick results, quick fixes, and sudden riches. They are not ready to endure any test. They have not mastered that a stone is laid in Zion, a tri stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. They just want quick fixes. Such people must know that every kind of destructive means, no matter how glorious it looks, will not produce a productive end. Means and ends are coterminous. For example, if you embark on Ponzi schemes and get rich quick alternatives available in the world today, be careful because such venture will end in poverty. They will slow you down. They will turn your energy into useless things rather than putting them into productive ventures that take time to produce. To stand and win by righteousness, momentarily we look like you have been left behind. To stand there and say you can win by righteousness, you must trust God completely because there are so many quick fixes and that will make you look like a fool. From my study of God's word, I know for sure, for example, that wealth gained by dishonesty will be diminished. I hope you are listening to me today. If you think you are smart, I pray none of you will fall victim of that and you're using this deal and that scheme and this thing to amass work quickly. Even work gained by dishonesty will be diminished. An inheritance gained hastily at the beginning will not be blessed at the end. Without a doubt, there is a definite punishment for those who hasten to be rich. Paul wrote to Timothy that such men drown themselves in destruction and perdition. Let's take some examples of those who are in a hurry to be rich, in a hurry to be promoted, in a hurry to put all things together and just be at the top. Their crash is always terrible. Their house is built on sand and not on the rock. Proverbs chapter 13, verse number 11. Let the word be our guide as we study together tonight. Proverbs 13, and right at verse number 11, it reads, and I quote, wealth gained by dishonesty will be diminished. <laughs> but he who gathers by labor will increase. I imagine sitting before the screening panel during the primary, or just before the primary, and they said, well, your story is known right around the world, and especially in Nigeria. We really don't, we know who you are, we know where you practice law, we know everything, but just for the sake of record, can we have your uh, certificates? And they were sure when I brought it all laminated, primary school, secondary school, A-levels, university, law degree, I mean, <laughs> law school, and eventually the doctor of ministry degree that I got from uh, Indiana Christian University. They said, we know they're authentic. Have a wonderful day, just go in peace. And you look back today and you start hearing all kinds of useless things on social media of men who want to lead, and yet they have such skeletons everywhere in their cupboard. They think the refuge of lies will protect them. No, 
there is a storm coming that will blow everything away. You have not had the last until God speaks. <laughs> Wealth gained by dishonesty will be diminished, but he who gathers by labor will increase. Proverbs 20, verse 21. Proverbs 20, 21. It reads, and I quote, an inheritance gained hastily at the beginning will not be blessed at the end. A few days ago, a news broke out here in England of a young man who killed a something year old grandparent, perhaps to have an inheritance. But by the time he ends up in prison, <laughs> inheritance will not function anymore. An inheritance get hastily at the beginning will not be blessed in the end. Proverbs 28, verse 20. Proverbs 28, verse number 20. It reads, and I quote, a faithful man will abound with blessings. A faithful man will abound with blessings, but he who hastens to be rich will not go unpunished. We have seen governors in our nation coming to spend some jail time here in UK and elsewhere. They've given us such a bad name, but a new breed is rising in the name of Jesus and we would, we would change the narrative by godless standard in Jesus' mighty name. A faithful man will abound with blessings, but he who hasten to be rich will not go unpunished. Mm. Look at verse 22. There also is it. A man with an evil eye hastens after riches and does not consider that poverty will come upon him. A man with an evil eye would do every crooked means just to be rich, but he does not know at the end poverty will come upon him. I really, I love what Paul wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6. I hope and I pray now become uh, something that you live by all the days of your life is protecting my heart, my life, my family from anything that could cause us to be afraid. I don't care what inquiry is raised by anyone in the world, the fear of EFCC is the beginning of cowardice. If you have not done anything wrong, it doesn't matter if EFCC comes into your house, they'll find nothing. Behold, an Israeli indeed, in whom there is no guile. That was what the Lord Jesus spoke about Nathaniel and himself testified of himself. The prince of this world comes, but he finds nothing in me. May that be our testimony in the mighty name of Jesus. First Timothy chapter 6, verse number 6 says, Now godliness with contentment is great gain. But we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich, fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful laws which drown men in destruction and perdition. If there's nothing you cannot do for money, then there's, no, <laughs> there's nothing. If, if, if you don't care what you do to get money, I'm not talking of labor, I'm talking of crooked means, then you will drown yourself in perdition. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. God forbid that that will be the testimony or the portion of any of you listening to me today in Jesus' mighty name. People of God, in my short life, I've come to understand that whatever begins in haste often, oftentimes ends in shame. Therefore, I implore you to please set in your hearts, especially those of you living outside of the shores of Nigeria, set in your heart that as stakeholders and not as spectators in the kingdom of God, as profitable servants and not unprofitable servants in God's kingdom, you must be ready to go through rigorous training in order to reign in life. Your motto and my motto for this exercise is no pain, no gain, no process, no progress. No pain, no gain, no process, no 
progress. If you are going to reach your goal and fulfill your destiny, you must be prepared for all the twists and turns and all the ups and downs in the voyage. Setbacks in the end will cause you to muster strength. It doesn't matter the challenges. God does not use an untested vessel. Keep on remembering that. He will test you before he deploys you. Therefore, thus says the Lord, I repeat again, I lay in Zion a stone for a foundation, a tri stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He who believes will not make haste. Are you tested? Are you fit for the master's use? For, this, for today's training, there are just too many heroes and heroines of our faith that we can look at in the Bible and consider what they went through. Although time will not permit us to take every one of them, a critical examination of the circumstances of their birth, a critical examination of what they went through will reveal that these legendary icons are mere mortals like us, and many things stood them out from their siblings, from their peers, and from their contemporaries. The Yoruba say, you know a child is going to be wise and smart by the choices he makes even at a tender age. We're going to take a few of them today. Remember, we are looking at God does not use an untested vessel with a question, are you fit for the master's use? I want us to take some heroes of our faith in the Bible consider the circumstances of your birth, and let's see what stood them out as stakeholders in life and not just mere spectators. Regardless of the number of children in their family, let's examine the way they were tested, whether or not they passed the test, and at the end, if they were rugged to do the things that God gave to them as assignment to do. None of them, you will find out, was used without being tested. Let's begin with Joseph, the son of Jacob, and see the way he was introduced to us in his teenage years. I want you to please give me your maximum attention, and I hope there are teenagers in your households listening to me today, or the ones who get this message to listen to, because we'll be one generation away from idolatry if we don't lay hold and get them now established in this truth. May the good Lord make your teenagers terrific things and not terrible ones in the name of Jesus. Genesis 37, beginning from verse 1. Genesis 37, beginning from verse 1. Now Jacob dwelt in the land where his father was a stranger, in the land of Canaan. If you don't mind, I want you to look at your Bible because I want to drive some points home. And if you have it on your iPad or phone, that's fine by me, but let's look at it together. Verse number two. This is the history of Jacob. Can you see a full stop there? Or my, or my Bible is different from yours. This is the history of Jacob. It's not a comma. It's a full stop. Yes, sir. What is the history of Jacob? Joseph being 17 years old was feeding the flock with his brothers and the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and sons of Zilpah, the sons of Labor. Their wives were slaves in the house before they became wives of Jacob. His father's wife and Joseph brought a bad report of them to his father. How many of you know that if Joseph was participating in their bad reports, he would not have any moral justification to report to their father? 
Now, what I want you to see here and to understand is that the Bible said this is the history of Joseph of Jacob. Full stop. Now, are we then reading about the history of Jacob, about the history of Joseph? Did God inspire this to cause some confusion? Or those who try to summarize history, they put punctuation in the wrong place? No. This is the history of Jacob. Joseph being 17 years old. What does that mean? Simply put, giving birth to Joseph and creating an atmosphere of love that nurtured Joseph so that he could know his destiny at a dental age and then be empowered to subsequently fulfill that destiny is a reason for the life and the very existence of Jacob, period. You have giants of faith in your house, but you may not be paying attention to them. You can buy them all kinds of computer games, all kinds of TV games and everything, except you create the atmosphere and you connect them and train them up. Sending them to school is like outsourcing your responsibility. Jacob created an environment for Joseph to grow, for Joseph to be nurtured, for Joseph to become a dreamer of dreams in his tender age while his brothers were seeing nothing. This is a primary assignment of parents. In case you do not know, every child comes into the world with what is called in Latin, a tabula rasa. Tabula rasa simply means a clean slate. A clean slate. The first set of people to write on the canvas of the hearts of our children are parents. You write with your tongue. Isaiah said, my tongue is a pen of a ready writer. You write on the canvas of their hearts. And you can begin to determine what their future will be by the things you say to them. If you remember John the Baptist, Angel Gabriel brought his name from the presence of the Lord. He said, I am Gabriel, who stands in the presence of the Lord. But because his father, Zachariah, asked for a sign, he was sentenced to a nine-month prison of muteness. He could not speak for nine months. He said, this will be your punishment for doubting what I've brought to you. You remain mute until the child will be born. At the naming ceremony, Elizabeth told family and relations that gathered together, his name will be called John. And they said, no way, nobody in your family had ever gone by that name. You can look through the Old Testament, you'll not find any John. So where do you get this one from? He said, let's ask the father. What did they give to the father? They gave him a writing tablet. God knew about your tablet before computer was ever invented. They gave him a writing tablet. And the moment he wrote his name shall be called John, his tongue was loosed. And the spirit of God came upon him and he began to prophesy concerning the future of John, who himself was filled with the Holy Spirit from his master's, his mother's womb. Friend, I want to tell you that Joseph was an open letter written by Rachel and Jacob to Egypt and the world at large by the grace of God. Please pay attention. Joseph was not just a dreamer. Joseph was a letter written by the parents to Egypt, and to the world. You may ask the question, how can a person become a letter? Well, since we started with eight verses of the Old Testament book of Isaiah, 28, 9 to 16, and eight verses of the New Testament book of 1 Peter 2, 1 to 8, let us now look at what I call 
the eight verses of the Now Testament, not old, not new, Now Testament, situated in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1 to 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, beginning from verse 1 to 8. It reads, and I quote, do we begin again to commend ourselves? Or do we need as some others a piece of commendation to you or letters of commendation from you? You are our piece. Humans now, not letter. You are our piece written in our hearts, known and read by all men. Clearly, you are an epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but by the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of flesh, that is, of the heart. And we have so thrust through Christ toward God. Now, that, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God, who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit, for the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. But if the ministry of death written and engraved on stones was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which glory was passing away, how would the ministry of the spirit now be more glorious? Let me share a little bit here. Moses was in the presence of God. He came down. He did not realize that his face was glowing, glowing and shining. And people were scared. So he had to take a veil to cover it. But anytime he went to the presence of God, it didn't cover. But when he returned, he covered because his face was shining. And when that had even stopped, Moses still kept it there. That's why there's a veil on the minds of those who read <laughs> Moses to today among the children of Israel. Uh, that veil can only be taken away when they turn to Christ. That's one. But that glory that was on the face of, of Moses, a man transfiguration was also on the face of Jesus Christ. So we saw that glory when we were with him on the mountaintop. And we had sought an excellent word from heaven. This is my beloved son in whom I will well please hear him. Peter wrote about it later. In, in the book of Peter. But do you know who first manifested that? He was Stephen. Stephen was just attending to table. Stephen was just distributing bread among the Hellenist uh, uh, widows. And suddenly when he stood before the Sanhedrin and before the judges of his day, the, what was inside broke forth on his face. His face began to shine like that of an angel. All those who are there, their eyes were fixed on him. This is the letter God wants you to become. If you go through training, if you pass the test and you become rugged, you will stand. It does not matter how many wolves will be on the field. You'll be able to maintain the standard of God's kingdom, no matter the situation, no matter the circumstances. People, people of God, our lives are a letter that others read. This is where I'm coming to today. Our lives are a letter that others read. It was D.L. Moody who said, out of 100 men, one will read the Bible, the other 99 will read the Christian. Out of 100 men, one will read the Bible, the other 99 will read the Christian. I'm not trying to clap for myself, but I was a letter on that day of the primary that the whole nation and the nations of the earth had to read. I'm not asking you to imitate me. I'm asking you to imitate me for as long as I imitate Christ. Because he did not deny who he was before Pilate. We must guard what we have received from God and protect it would our life even need be rather than buckling and become a murky water and polluted fountain before the wicked? 
out of 100 men, one will read the Bible, the other 99 will read the Christian. Derek Hartland, who ministered in our church several years ago in 1989 or 1990, said the following words. He said, the ungodly don't read the Bible, but they read you. Make sure you open to the right chapter always. The ungodly don't read the Bible, but they read you. Make sure you open to the right chapter always. And it, until you go through process, you can get here. God is not asking us to memorize scriptures and repeat them like a parrot. He wants us to internalize the word, to observe, to do what is written therein. Then we make translation of 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. If you have it, you can turn your Bible to the message translation of 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. It is very, very apt. He reads and I quote, your very lives are a letter that anyone can read by just looking at you. A few days ago, we were meeting with the gay network pastors in, in UK here. And uh, the host pastor began to appreciate Mrs. Bakary. He said, Mrs. B, I just couldn't believe in the midst of that tension, how you maintain your calm, how you are laughing and smiling with all that was happening there. She said, well, I'm looking at, the, at my husband. She's calm. She has no trouble. Why should I then begin to use Panadol for another person's headache? I don't even have any headache. He said, he was so calm. And I looked at him and I said, okay, if it's like this, I'm like that too. And people were calling from Lagos, from the World High Pastor. She started telling them, he's sleeping. You better be sleeping <laughs> so that you don't get into trouble. I got home. I left the field before they started voting. I left. I got home about 4 a.m. I asked my cook to prepare. I won't tell you what he prepared <laughs> so that you don't start laughing. He prepared original, mm, original food, <laughs> ground rice, and mixed elastico and put it at the center. By the time I finished eating at 5, I went to bed. I woke up 3 p.m. the following day, energized, ready to take on the whole world again. Listen, brothers, to that passage. Your life, your very lives are a letter that anyone can read by just looking at you. Christ himself wrote it, not with ink, but with God's living spirit, not chiseled into stone, but carved into human lives. Hallelujah. Your very lives are a letter that anyone can read by just looking at you. Christ himself wrote it, not with ink, but with God's living spirit, not chiseled into stone, but carved into human lives. If this is true, and it is, Joseph was not a letter written in a rush so that God will have to tie to his life with the caption, pardon the rush. No. He surely was tested before God used him as a world-class ruler. The letter titled Joseph actually began with two dreams in his father's house. That's the way it started. He called his brothers and said, I've seen a dream. He narrated the dreams of how all the sheep bowed to his own sheep. They hated him. They became envious of him, not only for the code of many colors, but for his dreams, because they began to understand what the young man was saying at the age of 17. And then he said, well, I know you didn't seem to like what I said before, but I got a second dream. Now it's not just 11 sheep buying to my sheep. I saw 11 stars, the sun and the moon, they bow to me. The father heard it, he rebuked him. Are you saying your mother who was dead then and myself will bow to you and your brothers? The father kept in his heart. His brothers hated him. They were looking for opportunity to teach him a lesson. Then the father sent him out to go look. You know the rest of the story. <laughs> so here comes the dreamer. Let us kill him and see what will become of his dreams. Many years ago, I preached on that. God's dreams never die. 
You can't kill them. If you try to kill a dreamer, you catapult him into power. The letter began with two dreams in his father's house. These two dreams would later correspond with two dreams he interpreted in prison, the one that the butler had, the one that the baker had, and ultimately would correspond with the two dreams that Pharaoh had in one night. Can you see God's sense of humor, the way he prepared his own? He gave him two dreams in his father's house, and then he would get him into prison one day to interpret two dreams, and ultimately there'll be two dreams awaiting him when Pharaoh will have those dreams. God was preparing to tune him, to give him skills in certain areas he didn't even fully understand. At the beginning, he was full of himself, showing forth. At the end of the day, he knew he was in charge. The first two dreams popped Joseph up. As I said, his brothers hated him, envied him. His father rebuked him, kept the dream in his heart. But the two dreams he interpreted in prison taught him lessons in patience and refinement because he was still spent two full years in prison before the nameless butler would remember to mention him to Pharaoh. You can read that at your leisure in Genesis 14, 9 to 15, when he was using I, me, my, and myself. I was brought here, I was done this, I, myself, me, my. God kept him there for another two full years until the butler remembered him. In Genesis 41, Pharaoh himself had two dreams. The last two dreams of Pharaoh catapulted Joseph into power. And by that time, it was interpreting Pharaoh's dreams. He didn't say, I mean my myself anymore. He said, God will give Pharaoh an answer of peace. God had gotten a body to manifest through. He had become an open letter that the whole of Egypt and Egyptians and the surrounding countries of the world we come to read. It became a phenomenon. Not only that, even Pharaoh identified the force that was in operation in the life of Joseph. In Genesis 41, he said, is there any man like this man in whom the spirit of God dwells? Pharaoh himself identified what the magicians could not do, what the Chaldeans and the astrologers could not do. This young man stood before them at the age of 30, not only interpreted the dreams, but brought a blueprint for economic survival from those two dreams. And Pharaoh said, I will set you above everything in Egypt. At the mention of your name, all knees will bow, and nobody will lift a finger in Egypt except at your word. This is the letter God is writing in this moment. You are you are getting equipped, you are getting trained because he's writing a letter that he wants the whole world to read. May you become that letter that the world will read and come to their senses and turn back to God in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. See GCC diaspora family, God's training manuals are sometimes in strange and unfamiliar fields. Thank God for Cambridge. Thank God for Harvard. Thank God for Princeton. Thank God for Oxford. I wasn't trained in any of those places. But I thank God for Ivy League universities. You are laboring so hard to ensure that you send your children there. But remember, what Daniel carried into Babylon was stronger and better than all the Cardian literature and all the Cardian language that he had to study for three years. There's something about the Holy Spirit of God that you must begin to uh, emphasize in your children and let them be carriers of God's power at a tender age. They will fear no evil. They will stand strong in the seasons of life. They will make a difference in a perverse and crooked generation. As for Joseph, the unfamiliar fields started from when he got to his brother. They threw him into the pit. They took his coat of many colors away from him and threw him into the pit. And then Judah, you know why we betray ourselves in church now? 
And while we are quick to sell our brothers in church, it was Judah who moved the motion for his sale. Why do we kill him? Let's make money out of him. And they sold him for 20 shekels. Bye-bye, Joseph. Bye-bye, dreams. We'll never meet again. He went through all that, and God, in his infinite mercies, ensured that Captain Potiphar will be off duty that day. And he will come to the slave market. <laughs> the steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord. He will come to a slave market to buy a slave. And he saw this young man. And he said, this is a, this is a different slave. I will buy this. From the pit, through slavery, to Potiphar's house, suddenly he became the overseer. I hope many of you are overseers are listening to me today. Because for every overseer, there, there are so many things, booby traps that I call professional hazards. This guy was good looking. When you see your pastor well-dressed, Italian suit, Italian shoe, a shiny ring, there are also Mrs. Potiphar in the house. Cast a long look on this man and says, sleep with me. She was not even trying to say, can we have coffee? <laughs> she said, lie with me, he said. How shall I say test? Test, test, how shall I do this? And sin against God. He considered the two dreams he had before now. He didn't see Mrs. Potiphar in eight. May God give you clear visions that will propel you into decision-making process that will eliminate everything that will derail you or, or distract you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. My God, from there, Mrs. Potiphar used circumstantial evidence to throw God's prince into prison. Well, the pit, the trans sahara slave trade route, Potiphar's house, the king's prison, and ultimately the palace. Guess what? Through it all, God's word was trying Joseph. Through it all. It was God's word that was trying him for what purpose? So that the word that he received through the dream, that the dream and the word spoken over his life will come to pass. Do not think God will use an untested version. It was God's word that was trying him in circumstances that are extremely difficult as a 17 year old slave, circumstances that are extremely difficult in Potiphar's house with Mrs. Potiphar, for doing right, being thrown into prison, who caused him to be crying, foul every day and night, and who have no time for solitary refinement. But in it all, it was the word of God trying him because God does not use an untested vessel. I wonder how many of you will enter a plane that's about to take off and the pilot announces, ladies and gentlemen, this is my first flight when I left school. When we were in school learning, I crashed like three, four times. But today they asked me to come and, <laughs> to come and, come and take you on this journey. If I wind up playing, I will tell them, oh, oh, on the plane, I need to get down. God forbid that I give my life to someone that will crash it. You have to be tested. You must become rugged before God can put you on display and say, this is my workmanship. Psalm 105, verse 16 to 22. Psalm 105, verse number 16 to 22, it reads, and I quote, Moreover, he called for a famine in the land. He destroyed all the provision of bread. He sent a man before them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. He went, they hurt his feet with fetters. He was laid in irons. I'm not sure you, you, you read that, that he was in fetters and irons like Paul and Silas. <laughs> Until the time that his word came to pass. Until the time that his word came to pass until the time that his dream was fulfilled, until the time that he saw his brothers bow before him and he remembered the dream. Until that time, the word of God was trying him. 
And where do you get that from? He sent a man before them. Joseph was sold as a slave. The heart is filled with feathers. It was laid in irons until the time that his word came to pass. The word of the Lord tested him. The word of the Lord tested him. The king sent and released him. The ruler of the people let him go free. He made him lord of his house and ruler of all his possessions to bind his princes at his pleasure and teach his elders, which King James Version calls senators, teach his elders or senators wisdom. Listen to me, my dear friends. The word of God will keep on testing you until the word that you have spoken over your life, the prophetic word you have received, we come to pass. It does not use an untested vessel. I want you to pray a prayer with me. Psalm 119, verses 49 and 50. Pray it with me. Pray it for yourself also, every time and at all times. Psalm 119, verses 49 and 50, a reason I quote, Remember the word to your servant upon which you have caused me to hold. This is my comfort in my affliction for your word has given me life. As he said it, will he not do it? God is not a man that he will lie, nor the son of man that he will change his mind. Don't become desperate that what God has said about you or said to you, there's delay somewhere. Delay is not denial. No, it's because there's a better pay ahead. Just be patient and keep on keeping on. Don't give up. Remember the word to your servant upon which you have caused me to hold. This is my comfort in my affliction. Your word has given me life. I want you to pray momentarily right now. I said, Lord, every word that you have spoken to me, they are yea and amen. I hold unto them. I trust you. As true as the word became flesh, that word you have spoken in my life is going to come into manifestation. Dreams will become reality. And I will be able to hold on until the very end in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. By the time Joseph finished his training, he obtained a bachelor's degree in material resource management from Jacob High School and from Potiphar's College. You can go and read it. They said everything that Potiphar had in the house, he was the overseer over it. And nothing was missing. Potiphar kept on increasing. His world kept on jumping up. He came to love Joseph, that he left everything in his hand. Jobs are not scarce, friends. Only faithful men are rare. The moment you are adding value where you work, or even an enterprise where you're a partner, then you see that nobody wants you to go. Jobs are not scarce. Only faithful men are rare. When he was managing other people's resources, it was not diverging their funds into a private account elsewhere. As a slave, he had no substance to his name, but he was prosperous. Why? And God was with Joseph. He was a prosperous man. Prosperity is not your fat bank account. It is the presence of God in your life. He did not only qualify and obtain bachelor's degree. My own words, he also obtained a master's degree in human resources management. If you are ever going to lead a nation or an organization, you must be versatile in this training, material resource management, human resource management. Who among humans can be worse than prisoners? He was sent into prison. The jailer did not require anything from his hand. He was in charge of everything. By the way, he did not jump out of bail. He did not, I mean, jail. He did not break jail to run away. Why? The one who gave him the dream will fulfill it, and they will come to where he was for the dream to be fulfilled. You can just wait patiently for God. I will remind you that day very soon when they come to fetch me and say, you know what? Come over. You will hear wherever you are in the world that the story is changing. I've said it to you before. I hope you are believing it. 
I will keep on declaring it until I see what God had spoken to me because he showed it to me in real time vision. Human resource management, you must be able to manage people. You must be able to, uh, to show kindness to people. He showed kindness. His own dream had not come to pass. He was interpreting other people's dreams that eventually will come to pass. Can you release your servant to God's hand to be magnanimous enough when your own dreams are not coming to pass and you are aiding and fast tracking other people's dreams to come to pass? His PhD, his PhD thesis was in spiritual resource management. That was when he was interpreting dreams. That enabled him to interpret the dreams of the butler and the baker. One look more, Ologia, school Ulula is a Yoruba proverb. One look more, Ologia, school Bolulo. In much sorrow is much wisdom. It was all these abilities, including the ability to manage spiritual resources, that catapulted Joseph to the palace where he became the father to Pharaoh and ruler over all Egypt. But this time, he had already acquired the competence, the capacity, the capability, and the character to teach the senators of Egypt wisdom. Friends, competence is not enough. Capacity and capability is not enough. Without a godly character, everything you have will crash your capacity, your capability, and your competence. There are so many others I could begin to look at. Maybe I'll wait till another time. David was one such man that was trained and tested by God until he became the king of Israel. Do you realize that Joseph left home at 17 and did not become prime minister of Egypt until he was 30? And his brothers did not see him until about two years after. So he left home at 17 plus 13 making 30, plus two years making 15. And you would think that the dream is forgotten. God has, has, has finished. Nothing can happen anymore until his brothers showed up and they prostrated before him. And the Bible says, and Joseph remember the dream. May your dreams come alive in the name of Jesus. But remember, no training, no reigning, no process, no progress, no pain, no gain. Let me close the teaching today within the next few minutes with personal experience in this area. Some of you listening to me right now never met my father. Some of you met my mother who passed on to glory four years ago at a very ripe age of 108 years. The reason for my parents' lives, especially that of my mother, is the man speaking to you today. This is the story of Abigail Ebudola Bakari, Fusto Tunde Bakari, period. It was my nephew, Yomi, who wrote that and said it when we had anniversary of Mama's uh, burial or during the uh, service of son. This is the history of Abigail Ebudola Bakari, Tunde Bakari. I am the letter my parents, especially my mother, wrote to the world. And then the Lord Jesus Christ then began, after they finished their own work, to begin to put it in cursing and writing that the whole world can read in this day and this time. And maybe before I finish today, you'll be reading and assessing the message yourself. We've been together, some of you, for more than 30 years, for more than 33 years. I thank God that I've been tested on many fronts, and I would like to highlight four of them. Now, I'm not claiming superiority or perfection or any earlier than that that any person, but that which our eyes have seen, our ears have heard, and our hands have handled of the word of life, the tests and the trials I've gone through are the things I would like to share with you. The first test that was major in the course of ministry was test of obedience. It manifested in different ways. I was blessed before I ever stepped into ministry. So money was not an issue. But a time came when everything dried up and God began to train me. I'd lost substantial investment in 1988. And it was like all hell had broken loose. There was no way to bounce back. 
That's why when I see people struggling today in their finances because they have made some major decisions that have found them, a compassion will rise up in me to quickly minister to them because I knew what God had taken me through. But the real critical test of obedience was not when I laughed, it was when I began to have and I bounced back again. It was in 1996. The Lord showed me in a dream a house. I was examining the house, it was in America, and I came out of the dream. I shared the dream with my wife. And then we had a message from Lagos that my first son was ill, Shegun, and we wanted to get back. So she quickly went to fix her hair. And Dr. Patricia Bailey called me on phone. My brother, where are you? And I told her where I was. I need for you to come immediately. I saw something that I believe is yours. She was looking for a property to buy. <laughs> and then got to this house. And the moment she stood in the house, the law said, it's for my servant, Trinity Bakary. She called me. Now remember, I'd seen a dream. I'd shared it with my wife. And she said, oh, there is this house. The Lord said, it's yours. I waited for my wife to come. And we went with Patricia Billy. As soon as we entered the house, I saw the staircase that I saw in the dream. Please be patient, be patient and listen to this. Instantly, I knew this is the house God wants to give to me. And we began to negotiate. And they said, the down payment, the days, the that, you all are into mortgage and everything where you are. It will cost $30,000 to do all. I left Atlanta for Canada to go and preach. I said, if the house is mine, the law will provide. They gave us time to pay. I finished preaching in, in Canada, returned to Atlanta, came to Lagos, took Pastor Ike, we went to the Gambia. Pastor Olus was in Lagos then, and he got a fax message from Canada that after ministering, they have credited my account with $30,000. I jumped, I said, see what the Lord has done. I quickly returned to America. We paid $30,000, a down payment, and they gave us the keys. Pastor Bank Akimola and Bishop Wale Okewa, the people I brought to the house to pray. I said, the Lord is now bringing us to America. Are you listening to me? <laughs> uh, Patricia Billy said we should go to North Carolina in order to get Beautiful furniture because that was the capital, furniture capital of the world. I was so glad. Brother, uh, Pastor Crefo Dollar already said it will confirm several Sundays, about 40 something Sundays, for me to be minister, ministering alongside with him in America. So I went to Lagos to say goodbye to them. Olus will be in charge of the ministry from now on. I was dancing, oh, Femi, oh, Femi, ye, ye. God loves me. I landed in Lorraine, Ohio to go and preach August 16, 1996. And in the cool of the day, the Lord came into the room. Arise and depart. Go back to Nigeria. That's your primary place of assignment. Pray, preach, prophesy until revival comes. After that, I can said, Lord, the house. The money you provided, it did not answer me one time. I called Mrs. B. He said, we are returning to Lagos. Ah, do you know? He said, God revealed it to me. I said, okay, then. We left the house. We were able to recover the deposit we paid, and we returned to Nigeria. Many years later, I saw in the Bible where the Babylonian envoys came to see Ezekiah, and he opened the Lord withdrew himself from him to test what was in his heart. And God spoke to me. I just wanted to see whether you cling to the house or you follow instruction. Everything lined up that day. Money, house, everything. Then he spoke. Arise and go back to Nigeria. That's your primary place of assignment. It was a tough test. I do not wish 
for even my enemy to go through such tests, but I thank God for grace to pass it. I can continue the test of courage in the year 2000. When I heard in Ghana that Obasanjo had set people up to arrest me for treasonable felony, and I had opportunity of fleeing to, to London, I had my, British, uh, my passport, Nigerian passport, with a permanent stay, or whatever they called it back then, before I obtained the British passport. And I quickly began to look for how to buy tickets. I entered the lift and Nehemiah rose up in me. Shall such a man as I flee? I refused to, re to flee. I returned to Nigeria, was arrested, interrogated, but not a pin touched me. I am still where I am. And in years later, I had to be reconciling General Basanjo with Yoruba leaders. And I remember him standing that day and saying, if anybody had said Bakari could do this, I would doubt it. No, we are letters being written to the world. You have to pass certain tests before God will use it. The test of courage, the test of faithfulness without compromise. In 2011, I was running mate to President Buhari, and they said I must resign as vice president of Nigeria and post the letter. I refused. I said that would be perjury. They said nobody will hear it. But the following day, it was front page of newspaper. They thought I'd signed the letter. I didn't. I'm still here. And now in 2022, it was test of faith and trust in God alone, not in the president, not in any, but in God alone. I want to tell you here, give me just five more minutes, tell you what really happened. By the 13th of April, I'd gotten information that the price tag for the nomination form, presidential form, is 100 million naira. I was livid. Fortunately, I was going to see Mr. President and the governors had gone to meet party, party organs or officials that this price is too much. Nobody should touch it. I mean, nobody, nobody should put that upon the nation. We'll be flaunting riches uh, before the poor. So I got to the president that day and I asked questions and the answers were given to me. Well, is to discourage those who are frivolous. Uh, the price of uh, the dollar exchange rate has increased. And, um, and then they need money for the campaign. The party needs to save money, to gather money. So I went back and I called three men, my lawyer, Barista Trope Adebayo, Pastor Shola Adesoye, Reverend Shegun Oshinaga. And with a tone of finality, I told them I would never buy that form and I'll be going back into Lagos to use the platform to expose these people of the shenanigans and all that was going on. With a final note, a tone of finality, I would never buy that form. I don't, I'm not a gambler. I went to bed on the 14th, the 15th was Friday, it was to be a good Friday. I was to fly at 6.15 a.m. So I went to bed about 10 at 2 a.m. I got up to go to the bathroom. I hope you are listening to me. And here comes my boss again. The Lord said to me, I did not go to the cross as God. I did not send an angel to die for man. In order to redeem man, I took the form of man and I paid the price for his sin. Go take that form and leave the rest to me. I came down at 15 a.m. I told the same people I spoke to the night before that I'll be taking the form the Lord has directed me. Why didn't I go to the states? Why didn't I go to delegates? Why didn't I lobby this and lobby that? All he asked me to do was take the form and leave the rest to me, and I've done that. And when they were now stepping down one after the other for this and for that, and they were stepping down, I asked for my iPad to be given to me right there. I wrote the speech that I gave that day. The, I'm not sure it's more than seven or eight minutes. I wrote that day that I'm not here to step down. I'm here to step up to be the next 16th president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. I'm not counting on man. I was not counting on anyone. I was counting on the one who took the form of man, who asked me to take the form and leave the rest to him. 
The rest we'll soon see in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you are wondering what the rest will be, it's a simple story in the Bible. Go study it yourself. It's called the story of Mordecai. Mordecai was at the king's gate. Mordecai exposed all the shenanigans and all the evils of men to eunuchs who wanted to execute the king. They were executed. Mordecai was not promoted. Amen was lifted up. Read your Bible. I wish I could take you through. Maybe next time we have opportunity, I'll be able to focus on David, focus on Moses, focus on Paul, and be able to focus on Mordecai. Mordecai refused. I mean, was not promoted. And the king, not somebody else, the king now instructed that anytime the officers will see Mordecai, they must bow. And they see Amen, the Agagata, I beg your pardon, they must bow. And Mordecai said, I'm a Jew. We bow to God, we don't bow to men. He didn't bow. And Amen said, I will deal with you. Not only you, I will kill all your people. Listen, the problem has started in Nigeria. Muslim, Muslim together, Christian, Christian, Christian. Is a lot of Allah. Today, even in the church, pastors are issuing <laughs> decrees and law that without PVC, you cannot enter to worship. Abba, Abba. <laughs> it becomes the standard. They're locking everything together. I'm just enjoying myself and smiling. When the first one bowed and the second one bowed, and one of them said, I'm young, there's still plenty of time in my life, I bowed. I went up there, I said, this is Mordecai's story in the king's gate. I refuse to bow. And you wait and see, it is Amen that will hang on the gallow he built. And at the end of the day, the house of Amen will become the house of Mordecai. Write it in bold letters and mark my word. You'll be witnesses in that day. Your letters being written to the world, but bold, but strong, know your God, and make sure you stand for him. Go through the test now. The testimony will follow. God bless you richly. Amen. I look forward to seeing you next time. Wow. Wow. What, what a word. What a word. Thank you. Thank you so much. So much, Pastor. We must be ready to go through rigorous training in order to reign in life. Our lives, our letters, that others will read. What a word. We, we, in fact, I don't have the right words to even effectively describe uh, how much, how much I appreciate the 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 quality of the word that, that we get. Thank you so much, Pastor, for for continuing to pour into our lives, for continuing to impact our lives. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Praise Jesus. Um, there's one question that came in. Uh, Pastor, if I can ask uh, that question now, and he came in very early. This question has nothing to do with what you spoke about. Somebody said they need a clarification on the paradox of faith, the paradox of faith that you say during your teachings that we are not looking for what is not lost, that we are looking for what is not lost. So the person said they wanted uh, clarification on the paradox, the paradox of faith that you use, that you say during your teachings, that we are looking for what is not lost. If my memory serves me right, and I want the person to go back on, the, on YouTube and everywhere, I can ask my son to also to produce, I can send it uh, to the leaders there. Uh, in the time that I was teaching that series, I was teaching on what frightens me about faith and what scares me about God. And that many times we are looking for what is not lost. For example, if you're looking for healing, healing was provided 2000 years ago, not today, it's not lost. If you're looking for riches and resources, it's not something that you have to gamble and, and to try hard to make happen is already provided. He who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Walking uprightly is already provided for. Healing and atonement provided for 2,000 years ago. And then he became poor so that we through his poverty might become rich. It's not something that you are, it's not lost. We should stop 
uh, uh, I, I, I want to be careful with my words these days and not to discourage people. If you really acting diligently to the voice of the Lord your God, what others are looking for will start looking for you. Blessings will pursue you, blessings will overtake you. That's the essence of what you are looking for is not lost. It's that as if almost all my life, everything that God has given me and has given to me comes to me where I am. And yet I'm hard working. I've been here on vacation. I can tell you I've done three or four services already. I'll still do one tomorrow, but I'm at rest. And I'm sleeping, I'm waking, I'm doing this, but I'm not doing these things for what I can get. They are mine already. They're given to me already. If I allow him to take me through process, I will not look for those things they will look for me. In Deuteronomy 28, he said, if you hearken diligently to the voice of the Lord your God and obey his commandments, these blessings will pursue you and overtake you. If you begin to pursue them, you're walking anti-clockwise. What you are looking for is not lost. Stop looking the wrong direction.